Okay, well, I get the honor of introducing our next guest, but before I do that, I'm getting hints from the back, uh, that it's time for the babies to go back to the nursery. So if you have a baby, feel free to take that baby back there. And, uh, and they will have loving care back there. Um, but, uh, and uh, also, if you do need a Bible, there will be Bibles provided. Just raise your hand, let us know, we'll get a Bible to you. Uh, my wife will eventually, once she's got the babies, actually, maybe, actually, Gabe, if you could get the Bibles, if anybody needs one, uh, feel free to lift up your hand if you need a Bible. But anyways, um, so yes, back to, so I'm going to introduce our, our guest preacher. Um, so his name is Michael Badger. He is a pastor of our sister church in St. Albans, uh, which was planted a year before us. So we both came from New King Church, which was over in South Burlington. Uh, the Lord had blessed so much in South Burlington. Um, and Michael Badger was coming from, was it from Tennessee that you came straight? Mm -hmm. That was yeah. the first place? Yeah. And, um, and so he was looking for a church to kind of call home and get familiar with Vermont. And so he stayed at New King Church, kind of learned the ropes. And then him and his team went to St. Albans to plant a church. Um, and they did that in October 2021, right? Yeah. And that's when they launched. And so uh, the Lord has really been blessing their church in so many ways. I love hearing uh, what the Lord has done. They've like moved to different places. The Lord provided them a place where they could stay long term. And um, and this last year they had five baptisms. Praise God, you know. Uh, so the Lord's hand is just so clearly uh, on their church, but also just so clearly on this guy, this man here uh, that you're going to hear from. So um, just, I love hearing his preaching. I love sitting under his uh, preaching, whatever, any chance I can get. Um, and so you get a special blessing today to hear from him too. Um, and you get to hear his, his beautiful voice. He has just a, a voice that's fit for radio. You know, my voice, it like, I, I don't really like to hear myself talk, but you guys probably don't either. But, um, but his voice is just luscious. It's, it's beautiful. So, um, and uh, if you need a microphone too to just get that voice out of your phone to hear, that it's very much Yeah, that's a good idea. So, um, but besides that, uh, he's got plenty of ministry experience. The Lord has used him in many ways. Uh, before he came to Vermont, he had ministered in Ireland for a year um, and for four years in Germany. And so, overall, five years uh, international experience. He did intercultural theological studies at a college that's called the Missionary Academy. Is that right? Yeah. The Missionary Academy. I mean, what, what better place to go to to become a missionary? So, um, <clears throat> anyway, so just really uh, has a lot of experience. And so now he's the lead pastor, church planter there. Um, as two other, well, wait, one other elder right now? One other uh, two other elders. Two elders. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, the first time. Okay. Um, so, uh, just really happy that he can be here. Really happy with what the Lord's doing in his life. So I hope you'll give him a warm welcome. You'll be hospitable to him. Uh, but just let's applaud and welcome him to the stage. All right. Well, that was a really overly generous <laughs> introduction. Uh, but, uh, man, I, uh, I am so excited to, uh, to be here with you all. I'm afraid this is going to, like, collapse on me. So if that happens, just pretend that nothing happened. And I'll be all right. Uh, but like you said, my name is Michael Badger. I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Church, and uh, and again, it's just a just a privilege and an honor for me to be here with you all. I learned so much uh, from uh, Pastor Aaron uh, during my time at New King, and so being able to to see what's going on here in Montpelier is just a it's a massive massive blessing uh, for me and uh, and for my wife. I think is back there with the kids, so pray for her. We've got a two-year-old who's really hitting those threes hard. He's about to turn three, and so if you have kids, you can imagine how that's going. Uh, but uh, the passage I'm going to be preaching on today is actually found in the closing statement of Paul in the first letter that he wrote to the church of Corinth. Uh, but before we actually look at this passage, it's good to know that Paul actually had a very good reason to be writing this letter in particular to this particular church. And the reason is because the church in Corinth was actually planted by the Apostle Paul himself, which you can see in Acts 18. 
But when Paul kind of moved away after he planted the church and he started doing ministry elsewhere, went on one of his missionary journeys, in his absence, the Corinthian church actually began to stumble significantly. Significantly. And so if you actually zoom out real quick and you look at the city of Corinth itself during this time, you will find that it was at the heart of a very important trade route. And like all trade cities, it was actually pretty notorious for its, its sexual immorality, uh, for its very religious traditions. It was also uh, known for kind of all sorts of corruption and, and all kinds of, of, of skullduggery. I really like that word. I'm trying to bring it back. A lot of skullduggery, a lot of shady interactions and things like that. And all of these dark influences actually began to seep its way into the church. And because of that, you started to, to see these kind of these splits and these fissures begin to occur. And the Corinthian church also began to even argue over matters such as marriage. You know, what's, what does marriage look like? What's, what's right divorce look like? Uh, spiritual gifts. They argued over the, the spiritual gifts in the church and how they're to, they to be used. Eating foods that were offered to idols. They even argued over the resurrection and a host of other issues. And so Paul hears of all of this trouble that has found its way into the Corinthian church. And he writes this first of two letters to, to just call them back to the faith. Right? To just bring them back to the faith that they first professed when he originally began this church. And he addresses all of the false teachings that these wolves had, had dragged in. And he rebukes the immorality that was spreading like wildfire. And he calls them to unity and to be about the business of the Lord. Now when you zoom back out and you again look at the city of Corinth, you will quickly find many parallels to the culture that we live in right now. Right? Remember when I was, I was kind of giving you the explanation of what, what the city of Corinth was, was like? We can just look around our own culture and we see a lot of similarities between the two. And not only that, but if you zoom back in and you look at the, at the church of Corinth, sadly, again, you will see some parallels to many modern day churches as well. You will see false teachers trying to infiltrate and, and proliferate their, their false teachings. You will see many churches trying to uh, kind of fight amongst themselves over secondary matters. You will see many of them bending their knee to the cultural sexual ethic. And with that, you will see churches compromise biblical truth as they are really just washed to and fro by every cultural way. Mm -hmm. You see that clearly. And this is why I really want us to focus on this morning, on this, this really small pairing of verses in Paul's parting words to the Corinthian church. Because what he is calling them to is what I think the church in the West, many churches all over the world, but especially our churches here in the West, desperately need in our own time. Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. So this morning I want us to look carefully, really, really look carefully at this call made by Paul here in these two small verses. A call to a godly kind of courage. Because as we continue to run the race that the Lord has set before us in this Christian life, we, like the Corinthian church, will be met by those who would love to see us fall. Who would love to see us come face to face with failure. Whether that be from attacks from without or from divisions within. But before we begin, before we look at this passage, please pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, what a privilege this is to come together as, a, as your body, Lord, as your bride, mm -hmm. to lift up praises to your name, mm -hmm. Lord, to, to see you glorified this morning. And so, Lord, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit is present with us now. 
We praise you that he is. And Lord, I pray that through your spirit, Lord, that you allow us to hold on to the truths that you want us to keep, Lord. And that you, Lord, just bring our hearts to a, a new life because of what your word says. Amen. And Lord, protect us from error this morning. I pray this in your son's name. All right, now, one of the most important jobs in ancient times for a guard of a city would actually be that of the night watch. The soldier or soldiers who were given the task to keep watch from the city wall or the city outskirts for any signs of trouble. This was a very important job. One of the most important jobs in the ancient times for, for the city guard. Now, the most detestable thing that the night watchman could possibly do was, was what, do you think? Fall asleep. Fall asleep. Now, the day plus for you, Aaron, man. Yeah. See why you're the pastor. <laughs> for a guard of the night watch to fall asleep was to allow for the possibility for an enemy to approach and even gain access to the city. And so it was really no surprise that these watchmen were called to be you know, watchful, right? lest the city fall because of their lack of vigilance. And there were serious consequences for guards who fell asleep on the job. Now, the church in Corinth became like that of a lethargic and sleepy guard. When they were supposed to be awake and alert and on watch, they were caught sleeping. And because of this, they were unaware of, of false teachers that began to slip into their presence. And they were, they were oblivious as they began to take their moral cues from the Greco-Roman culture around them rather than from the teachings of the apostles, from, from God's word. And friends, there are many churches, especially here in New England, who are very much like the church in Corinth, as I said in my introduction. There are many churches who have fallen asleep. And so their city gates have been overrun by wolves. False teachers that have entered into their pulpits and have preached a gospel that sounds wonderful to the ears, but is empty of all but death. There's so many churches that look like that now. So many churches that are preaching a gospel that says there is no need for holiness. No need to prayerfully seek to align your life in your mind, in your heart, to Jesus. A gospel where there's, there's no hell and Christianity is simply one path among many that lead to God. A gospel who says, or that says that all men and women are, are just basically good, right? They're just basically good except, except the ones I don't like. And so there's no need for repentance of sin or bowing the knee to the King of Glory. And these sleepy churches, in terms of their moral outworking, really don't look any different from the world around them. They have the same ethic as a humanitarian club down the street. They just kind of slap some Christian lingo onto it. But the Apostle Paul, after correcting and rebuking the Corinthian church for 15 chapters, can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting a, a letter that's just rebuking you for 15 chapters? It would be rough. But after spending so much ink waking up this church, he calls them to wake up and be watchful. And brothers and sisters, we must heed that command as well, right? Now that leaves us with, with somewhat of a question. Though. What does it mean to be watchful? How are we to be watchful? What does this look like? Well, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said simply when he said, that to be watchful is to be awakened and made aware of the danger around us. Now, we as Western Christians, I think, are used to living in a place of, of relative peace. I use that term, relative peace. We often don't see the, the kind of persecution and malevolence uh, or even see it to the same degree that our brothers and sisters uh, experience in other places in the world, such as Somalia or, or North Korea or, or maybe Libya. And because we don't really see that same type of persecution, and we don't really feel it to the same degree, we can often forget that the world that we live in right now is what Paul calls in Colossians 1, the domain of darkness. Meaning the world that we still yet live in is a fallen and sinful world. And in this domain of darkness, we have an enemy. 
1 Peter 5, 8 identifies this enemy as the devil. And the devil is prowling around like a lion. And this lion is hungry. And he is on the hunt looking for someone to devour. Now again, we in the West can sometimes miss that spiritual reality. Right? The reality that we do not wage our battles ultimately against flesh and blood, as Ephesians 6 tells us. Our ultimate battle is not against governments or, or, or groups or organizations or, or even other, other people in this world, but rather our battle is against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Amen. In other words, our battle is a spiritual battle mm -hmm. against Satan and his demons. It's another unpopular teaching here in the West. And so part of being watchful means to be awakened to this reality. To be aware of it. To understand that behind every attack that comes our way, which, which we live in Vermont, we see attacks quite frequently. But to know and to be aware that behind every attack that comes our way, there is a spiritual battle being waged. We are to watch for the schemes of the devil as he attempts to send those into our churches who would lead us away from the truth of Scripture. Now, if we are to be truly watchful, if we are to be that vigilant guard on the wall, then, brothers and sisters, that means we must, we must be saturated in the Word. We must be. We must be like how one Puritan described John Bunyan, that when we're pricked, we bleed Bibline, we be, uh, bleed the Bible. And the reason for this is many. We want to be saturated in, in the Word because, because that's where true life is found, right? That's one reason why we want to be saturated in the Word, and that's how, also how we grow in our relationship with our beloved Savior. So that's, those, are, those are absolutely true reasons why we want to be people of the Word. But it is also because our enemy is subtle. He is subtle. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, he said that the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. Meaning a lot of the warped and twisted teachings that he tempts us with. And that he, that he blinds the world with. Sounds good. Not only does it sound good, but it, but it, it feels right. To our flesh. And the only way that we will be able to tell the truth from the lie is if, is if we are in the Word. That's it. And so for us as a church to be truly watchful means to keep an eye on the enemy and be devoted to the Word of God. So, we must be watchful. But friends, it's, it's actually not enough to just be watchful. An alert night watchman could see an enemy coming, but it would really do little good if he fled at first sight, right? And so Paul doesn't want us just to see the enemy coming and be aware of it. He doesn't just want us to identify when, when false teaching creeps in or, or assaults upon the truth of God are happening around us, but he is also calling us to plant our to stand firm in the faith. Now just briefly, what is Paul speaking here when he says to stand firm in the faith? What is this, what is this faith that he's speaking of? Martin Lloyd-Jones again makes a good point that, that in order to understand what it is, we first must understand that there is a faith to begin with. There is a faith. And while there may be things that we can disagree on in-house within the church, in the church, such as the doctrine of the end times, or, or like how the service goes, the order of service, or even on things such as predestination, <laughs> there are things that the Lord has made clear, has made clear within the pages of Scripture that we are called to stand absolutely firm on. Now, include in this biblical sexuality, the nature of marriage, a uh, man being made in the image of God as a man and woman, but above all, the truth of the gospel message itself. The truth of the gospel message itself. Salvation being by faith in Jesus alone, by the grace of God alone. 
that we are, we are sinners in need of saving. This is what Paul means by the faith. And so it is here that Paul is calling us to be an unmoving wall, to be unwavering, to see no ground. And now this can, this can really get us into hot water, can it not? There is an immense pressure on the Western church right now that is coming from our culture. I think, I think we here in New England feel it almost every day. And this pressure is being placed on us from, from multiple sides. On one side, we're being pressured to become essentially universalists. To declare what Jesus says in John 14, 6, or, or what Peter and John say in, in Acts 4 is not really quite true, and that there's actually many ways to God. Not just through Jesus' name. Not just through faith in Him. There's pressure for us to validate other religions, to say that they are just as true as our own. On another side, we're being pressured to, in their words, keep our religion out of their lives. I'm sure you've heard that one before. <laughs> what they mean by this is either to remain silent on subjects such as abortion or homosexuality or transgenderism or even, even the hookup culture, maybe, or to falsely say that Scripture does not adequately speak to those topics and therefore we must accept that they are morally good. There's pressure from another side to view Scripture as less than inerrant, as less than the God-breathed Word of God that it is. And the list goes on. And so we have all of this pressure. All of this pressure is put on us to accept the cultural norms of our day and become, become kind of squishy, right? Become squishy and, and pliable and have us bend the Word of God around their worldview and and sin. And you see this happen in churches again and again. Where Paul is calling them to stand firm, they give way. And so churches fall not always because they neglect being watchful, but because they neglect standing firm. The currents of the culture and the influence of the adversary became, become too much for them. And so they get carried away from the truth like a ship without an anchor. Hmm. They make allowances for the world's ethics and beliefs to find a home within their congregations. And bit by bit, the solid ground of faith that they once found themselves on hmm. become eroded. Yeah. And that's what was happening in the Corinthian church. And, and brothers and sisters, if we don't stand for it, that is what will happen to our churches as well. When I was preparing to preach on this subject, my mind again and again went to the martyrs all throughout church history. One of whom we as English speakers actually owe a great debt. William Tyndale made it his life's mission to get an English Bible into the hands of you know, even the plowboy in the field, saying to a friend who thought this was simply unneeded, William Tyndale said, if God spare my life, Ere many years, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scripture than you do. Ooh. <laughs> right. Snap, right? Now, is that the thing you say still? People still say snap or no? Is that gone now? Why do you want that? Got it. All right. Perfect. But because of his pursuit to make the scripture available to the common people of England, and because he believed that the truth found within its pages was actually worth dying for, he became a fugitive of his home country. He, he fled to Germany. And he was there for, for many, many years until he was finally found. And he was found because his, one of his best friends, who, was, who he thought was helping him with the translation, betrayed him, turned him over to the authorities. And he was put to death by a strangler. But Tyndale, he was a man whose heart burned for the truth of Scripture. Whose dedication to the Word of God led him to stand firm in the faith even unto death. Men and women like Tyndale all throughout church history have given their lives because they saw the faith. They saw the gospel to be more 
valuable and precious than any earthly treasures that they could possibly gain by moving even an inch off of the Word of God. So it is this kind of steadfastness that Paul is calling us to. We are to be watchful. We are to know that the enemy wants us to cower as the domain of darkness presses in, seeking to uproot us. And yet Paul is saying, stand firm. He's saying, stand firm. Do not be weak in the knees, but stand tall in the faith, in the truth that is revealed to us in the word of Christ. Hold fast, even when the word, world is, is calling you names. When, when it's threatening your job, your reputation, or, or even your life, stand firm. Now, of course, this is not an easy task to do. And I know that in and of myself, I am, I am far too weak for this. And I do not believe that I'm alone. Let me share uh, with you another example from church history. Who doesn't love church history? At the eve of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, Martin Luther, who had been writing really fervently on the doctrinal abuses of the Catholic Church, was put by the Catholic Church before a, a tribunal. He was put, put on, this tr in, in, on, a, on a trial in a German town called Worms because of these writings against the Catholic Church. Now, if you were to read these works of Luther that were speaking out against uh, the falsehoods in the Roman church, you would read the mind of a man who was full of zealous fire. He didn't hold anything back when he was writing these, uh, these, these pamphlets. You would, you would read a man who believed firmly on the authority of Scripture as the rule and standard of the Christian faith and who was extremely unapologetic about it. And so when Luther was brought before this tribunal and he was asked to recant, to disavow all of his writings that, had pot, that was piled in a stack before him under the threat of imprisonment and possibly even death, everyone who was there was, was watching. And they were waiting with, with bated breath to see what Martin Luther would say. Now they were expecting this, this fire to come out of him. For him to, to, in front of everybody, in front of all of these all of these. Uh, uh, representatives of the Roman Catholic Church to denounce Rome and the Pope. That's what they were expecting. But when he was asked if he would recant, what came out of him was a, was a small voice. One that could be barely heard above the murmuring of the crowd. A weak voice that didn't speak to the heirs of the Pope, but instead that asked for a day to think about it. He wavered. He wavered. Now, friends, in my shame, I must admit that the trembling of Luther's heart on that first day of the Diet of Worms so frequently mirrors my own heart in much less dire circumstances. So for Luther, it was, it was easy for him to stand firm when, when the standing was being done behind a bed. For me, it is easy to stand firm from, from here, behind a pulpit. But when confronted with the world, and those who, who hate the message of the gospel, when confronted by those who, who want to see me turn my back on God's supreme truth, my friends, my, my heart can be brought to tremble. And I can be. So like Luther, instead of standing firm in the faith, I can be tempted to look for an out. Have you felt the same? Have you felt that way? Maybe in your in your workplace. Maybe in your conversations with your unbelieving neighbors or friends or family members. Well, brothers and sisters, this is why Paul in our passage this morning recognizes that for us to stand firm in the faith, it will take a godly courage. Paul says to be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and to be men. Now the Greek word that is translated to be men is the great Greek word androzomai. Androzomai. Which also means to act courageously. 
The idea Paul is giving across here is that we as believers are to no longer act like children. To, to act like, like boys, essentially. Who hide behind their parents when difficulties arise and, and enemies abound. But instead, we are to act courageously as men and women of God. To bravely stand against the culture that tells you that the Bible is antiquated. That your, that your beliefs are nonsense. That true freedom and spiritual fulfillment is found in the self. That the true and best ethic is found in the pleasures of the flesh. And to face all of that and hold true to God's word come what may. To be courageous in your workplace, in your community, in your family, and even in your home. But again, friends, I do not have it within myself to muster up that kind of courage. I'm far too much of a coward for that. And so that leaves us with the question, where is this courage to come from? Where does it, where does it come from? How do we gain this courage to stand firm in the faith when the world is against us and when there is an enemy that is vested with it, that has a vested interest in seeing us fall and fail? Well, my friends, the source of our courage is to actually be the very source of courage that brought Jesus to the cross. If you have your Bibles with you, look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2. If you're looking for it, I'll just go ahead and read it. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says that because of the joy, because of the joy that was set before him, Jesus did what? He endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so what this means is because, because of the joy of setting His people free from the bondage of sin and death, and for the joy of being our risen King, Jesus, with all courage, faced not only the pain and humiliation of the cross, but He faced the wrath of the Father. The just punishment for our sins. And he did so for the joy that was set before him. And he did so with all courage. And so brothers and sisters, that is to be our source of courage as well. What gives us the courage to stand firm is peering over the horizon of this life. Of seeing the joy that is set before us in the life to come. That's the source of our courage. Our courage does not come from our own ability to rid ourselves from fear, but rather it comes as a gift from God as we keep our eyes fixated on Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith and the promises that he made to us. This is what gave the Apostle Paul courage, as he explains in Romans 8.18. Paul suffered greatly at the hands of the domain of darkness, at the hands of the men who were set against God. And yet he faced the suffering courageously because he knew this unyielding truth. That the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So friends, don't, don't miss what Paul is saying here in Romans 8. He is saying that all of those things in this life that bring sorrow to our hearts, including the pain brought about by standing firm on scriptural truth, the pain that comes from, comes from maybe becoming social pariahs or being mocked by our friends and peers. Ooh, that was close. The pain that comes from losing our jobs or, or being scorned by our communities, all of it is not even worth thinking about. When compared to the glory of Jesus Christ that is going to be revealed to us once this life has passed away. In the world to come, who would even think was all of that pain and suffering that I went through for the sake of Christ worth? Those, those thoughts aren't even going to enter into our minds. We won't even begin to have those thoughts because our hearts and minds will be so caught up in the delight, in the pleasure, in the majesty of seeing our King. Our friend Jesus face to face. And this is so important for us to know. 
Because godly courage does not come from confidence that we won't be attacked by this world. It doesn't come from, from confidence that we will be shielded from all suffering in this life. But it comes from confidence that our lives are hidden in the one who has overcome this world. Amen. It comes with the confidence. Just as Colossians 3 tells us that when he returns in glory, he won't be alone. We will be there with him in glory. So that is, that's what gives us courage to stand in faith. To stand firm in faith. That is how we defeat the fear of man that so often has us cowering. We must simply keep our eyes on Jesus. And then, as the author of Hebrews says in chapter 13 and verse 6, we can confidently say, the Lord is my help. I will not fear. For what can man do to me? And this was actually Martin Luther's conclusion as he went back to his room after that first uh, day of trials. As his courage wavered and he asked for a day to think over his choice of whether to recant or not, Luther recognized that up to this point he was able or he was only relying on himself and his own measly courage. But now when the enemy was actually at his doorstep, demanding he turn away from the truth of God's word and recognizing that he had come to the end of himself, he finally cried out to the only one who could provide him with the courage to stand firm. Now, by God's grace, we actually have Luther's prayer from that very night. And it's a little long, but please bear with me, because as I read through this prayer, I think that, I think that you'll be able to identify with it. I think you'll find that, that maybe you have actually prayed the exact same prayer, maybe felt the same feelings that, that Luther felt on this very night, and maybe you need to pray these exact same words. And so again, it's, it's a little long, but please bear with me. He says, Almighty, eternal God, how dreadful is the world. Behold how its mouth opens to swallow me up, and how small is my faith in you. Oh, the weakness of the flesh and the power of Satan. If I am to depend upon any strength from this world, all is lost. Oh, my God, help me against all the wisdom of this world. Do this, I beg you. The work is not mine, but yours. I have no business here. I have nothing to contend for with these great men of the world. I would gladly, gladly pass my days in happiness and peace. But the cause is yours, my Lord. And it is righteous and everlasting. Stand by me, O faithful and unchangeable God. I lean not upon man. It would be in vain. You have chosen me for this work. I know it. Therefore, O oh God, accomplish your own will. Stand by me in the name of Jesus Christ, who will be my shelter and my shield, yes, my mighty fortress, through the might and strengthening of the Holy Spirit. I'm ready even to lay down my life for this cause, patient as a little lamb. For the cause is holy, it is your own. Though this world be filled with devils, and though my body, originally the work of, and creation of your hands, go to destruction in this cause, yes, though it be shattered into pieces, your word and your spirit, they are good to me still. It concerns only the body. The soul is yours. It belongs to you and will also remain with you forever. God help me. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we face this, this world of darkness, as we face all of these pressures that come crashing in around us, let this be our prayer. If we are to stand firm, we must be utterly dependent on God. We cannot lean on our own, our own courage. We must rely on God, because in Him we are held safe. And the last command from Paul in verse 13. I'm just going to briefly mention, because if I don't, we'll be here for probably another hour or so. But it is to be strong. To be strong. And this command is much like the command to be courageous. The strength that is required to stand firm and to be courageous cannot be found within our own selves. But it is found in God, given to us by the Holy Spirit. 
And this was the truth that, that Moses was actually trying to get across as he was passing the torch along to Joshua. Moses tells Joshua that it will be up to him to take the land that was promised to God's people. And as he was telling him this, he said in Deuteronomy 31, 7, 8, it says, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. For you must go with this people into the land the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. Then he says this. He says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid nor discouraged. So I want you to notice how Moses tells him to be strong and courageous. But not because Joshua was, was, a, was, was skilled at warfare. Because he was a, a strong general or, or some kind of great leader or anything like that at all. He wasn't basing his courage and strength. Or he was telling Joshua not to base his courage and strength in any quality that he possessed in and of himself. But Moses anchors Joshua's strength in the Lord who goes before him and is with him. He anchors it in the God who will never leave nor forsake him. So brothers and sisters, as we run this Christian race, as we face enemies at every turn, the strength that will give us the power to make it across that grand finish line to the great prize that awaits us, comes completely and utterly from the God who goes before us. From the God who has already conquered sin and death. And who is always beside us and who will never leave us nor forsake us. Now I considered just doing verse 13 for this sermon, but I wanted, as my conclusion, to kind of just kind of tack on verse 14. And the reason why I wanted to add verse 14 was because what can often happen when we see passages or when we see verses such as verse 13, this, this call to be watchful, to stand firm in the faith, to be, to be men and to be strong, we can sometimes misinterpret courage and strength as, as being a brute. And yes, we are called to be strong. There is a great lack in the Western church of Christians willing to be strong and courageous. James Montgomery Boyce actually once said that the biggest problem with the church today is that it was full of wimps. And I tend to agree with him. But as we stand in the faith, as we face the domain of darkness, yes, we must be courageous and strong. But we must also remember that Paul says in verse 14, let all you do, let all you do, which includes verse 13, be done in love. And so let us remember that as we go out and as we stand firm in the faith, we are to do it in love. Because friends, ultimately, when we are speaking with unbelievers, our main objective is not to simply win an argument. But our goal should be to have such a love for the person that we see in front of us, who may even be our enemy, who may despise us and slander us, but to have such a love for them that the gospel is ever ready on our lips to share with them. Because, because how wonderful would it be to see our, our greatest enemies in this life standing next to us, worshiping our Savior forever? So let us do all of it. Let us be watchful. Let us stand firm. Let us be courageous and be strong. Let's do so with love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to echo the prayer. Lord, of our brother, Martin Luther. God, we, we live in New England. Lord, we live in a place where the enemy is surrounding us. We live in a place that, that hates your word, Lord, that hates your gospel, that wants us to, to bend and break. And Lord, when we are going out and we're facing that world, God, I know I can, I can at least speak for myself, Lord. I, I am full sometimes of, of fear. And when I'm full of fear, Lord, it's just a reflection that, that Lord, I'm putting my ultimate trust not, not in you, but in myself. I'm not trusting you with my reputation. I'm not trusting you, Lord, with, with, with my life. 
And so, Father, God, I pray, Lord, that, that as we go out and as we contend for the faith, as we go out and, and share the gospel with the world that desperately needs it, Lord, that, that we can lean on you for our courage and for our strength. Lord, I pray that you protect us from the wolves who want to infiltrate into Imago Christi, into, into Redeemer, Lord, into, into New King. And to see us, Lord, not stand firm on the faith, Lord, but to, but to waver, to make allowances. So, Lord, I pray, God, that through your spirit, you protect us from that. And you allow us to stand firm in the faith that you have revealed to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, in your word. I pray this in your Son's holy and precious name. courage in Christ. Um, that's just something that he was really hitting on, is that Christ is our example in all of this, isn't he? He's our example. Um, he went forward and he was the light that the darkness did not overcome. And yet, it physically looked like it did overcome him, didn't it? Because they literally killed him, right? They took him to court, they put him on trial, they found him guilty, right? They mocked him, they scoffed him, they bruised him, they battered him, they whipped him, and they crucified him. And it looked like they beat him. It sometimes might look like us, looks like we're getting beat. But when we go forward in faith and confidence, trusting the Lord's will, saying, submitting ourselves to his will, then ultimately the darkness will not overcome, but the light will overcome. Just as Christ overcame. And for eternity, we'll be sitting in that victory. And all, all, these, all these things will be like nothing in comparison to the full weight of glory that we have to see. Um, so, and that, and that kind of connects with what we're going to be talking about. Continuing our time of worship, going into the Lord's Supper, the communion, which we celebrate every week uh, at, here at Mongo Christi because we want to root ourselves and ground ourselves in the gospel continually, the gospel of Christ. Um, we see Christ giving himself in love for us. Just like that last verse said, right? Um, in love. In love. I wasn't doing this just to be a jerk or something, right? Uh, but in love for us. In love for me. Put your name in there, right? Uh, he poured out his blood. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Give him my blood for you. For you. 
And so he saw us in our sin. He saw us in our darkness and our uncleanness and all of our failures, how we fell short of the glory of God in every which way. Amen? And yet he boldly ran into the mess. He ran into the mud. He ran into the darkness. He ran into the scary big world that is the sinful world we live in. And he became like us. And he was willing to be bled and destroyed for us. And what courage is that? What courage is that? And a stable, steadfast courage. Immovable. Abounding in love. And because he loved us, we can love him. And because he loved us so courageously, we can courageously love others. Amen? We can courageously love in our church and in our community. And we can be useful for him. Amen? Amen. Does anybody want this for our church? That's what I want. I want what Paul was exhorting the Corinthians here. I want us to receive that exhortation. I want it to shape my life and our church's life, my family's life. And I want us to be like Christ, conquerors, more than conquerors, through him who loved us in love. So, um, anyway, so that's what we remember as we go to the Lord's table. We remember Christ, his blood shed for our sins, forgiveness granted to us because of his blood shed. We remember his body broken so that we could be healed, right? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded so that our wounds could be cured. And so that's what we remember as we go to the Lord's table. This is called the Feast of the Saints. It's our remembrance of him. And so what we're going to do is the elements are in the back. We're going to get up. We're going to go get those elements, go back to our seat. And we're going to have a time of meditating on the body and blood of Christ, remembering the gospel, washing ourselves in the gospel, in the blood of Christ, in the waters of the Spirit, and remembering what he has done for us. We so need that. We need that every day, by the way. But we're going to do it you know, every week here. So kind of help along with that. So um, if you'll please stand, get those elements, go back to your seat, take some time to meditate on the body and love Christ.